Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold and a lamb of your own flock and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today uh, we have a wonderful group of folks who will be coming forward for confirmation and reaffirmation. And it begs a question that we don't often talk about, which is, what is this church Uh, you are being confirmed and reaffirming within. Who is this odd group of people at St. George's that you have come to? No, that's not what it's going to go with. (laughs) But I couldn't couldn't resist, right? What does it mean to say that we are members and that we are disciples of Jesus who belong to a one holy and Catholic church. So that's what I want to talk to you all about today. Those three things, one, holy and Catholic. Now, in case you think I'm just addressing them, I'm addressing all of you because in part you say this every Sunday as you proclaim the Nicene Creed, as you pray it literally ending with amen, let it be so. This is a question that we rarely actually talk about is what is it, what are what are we even saying when we say one holy catholic church the oneness uh, is something unique oftentimes i think when we come to this theme of oneness we come with our cultural filters on and so we believe that oneness has to do with us that oneness has to do with our ability to be reconciled with one another, that our oneness has to do with our agreement. Uh, And certainly that might be part of it. I mean, one would hope that even in our biggest disputes, we could be reminded uh, of God's love for us. But our oneness, our oneness has to do with God and Jesus and the Spirit the power of reconciliation and forgiveness and love that flows from one God to all of the people. It is God's oneness that makes us one. It is about God and not about us. It's about community that is whole because of God's making it whole, not because we make it whole. Through the waters of baptism, yes. Through the Spirit's empowerment, yes, that we will proclaim today. But this oneness is deeply made one by Jesus Christ upon the cross for our redemption and not for ours only, but as we say, for the whole world. Think, for instance, of Paul's vision of this oneness in Corinthians. Corinthians is filled with it. Chapter 1, 12, 27, 15. It's all over the place. That Christ, as one with God, is reflected in our coming together. That it is Jesus who truly draws us together. Uh, We are a body of believers, we say. Uh, A body made in Christ's image through our sacramental life, but also through our living of life in the world. There is, uh, just as uh, we repeated in Ephesians, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, deeply in our baptismal Liturgy, a oneness that is found there in God's very being and not one that says, well, we're all one because we like one another, right? We weekly come as followers to commune with the oneness of the church, with the oneness of God. I once was told that a child had talked about the fact that this table is just the end of the table, And that the table stretches from this end all the way out. And all of the other Christians and all the saints of God to the very end with Jesus at the head. And this sense of oneness that's created by God's vision of who we are and who we can become. So we are one in this place together. 
participating together with all our faith and our doubts. And I think that's really important is that we don't we aren't one because we all agree that we've all put our questions aside. We are one by the faith that we we proclaim, which is faith after all. Right. It's not fact. We don't say, OK, the facts we all agree. It's a it's a faith statement that challenges us and our own questions. One that says that it's not about this community saying to you all, well, now you're worthy of belonging so you can be confirmed, but rather that God has made you worthy of belonging so we welcome you into this community. Those are radically different things than the culture tells us. The culture will tell us that to be part of our tribe, you have to do and agree with everything we say. But in the church, we say, no, welcome. God has made you worthy to walk through these doors and be a part of our community. And our job is to recognize that from God's perspective and not from our own. Here in this place, we recognize a major difference between the way the world works and the way the church works. Our oneness, our willingness to welcome to say all of you may belong is a radical statement of Christ's hospitality, of Christ's love and forgiveness. For here we can say we believe in one God and one church, a church that seeks to reflect the very best of who that one God is. Now, we get to holy, right? The second one. A holy church. And again, I think this is also confusing. We slip a bit in our theology and we begin to think that we're made holy because we do the right things. Or because we go to church. Or because we're baptized. Or we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Or that somehow, because the rest of the world works on an economic model that somehow our exchange of being good, whatever good is, is so that we can get good with God and become holy. Holiness is none of those things. None of them. Holiness and the holiness of the church is about being wholly different like God is. It is to be different. It is to be outside of our material understanding and our economic exchanges. Holiness, this otherness, is created by a God who is wholly other, greater than which can be thought, right? That kind of ontological statement that God, if, if you can imagine who this one God is that we worship, then your imagination isn't quite big enough yet. That this holiness, the ground is made holy not because Moses stepped on it, but because God was present there, present there. And so Moses, Moses is like, I have to remove my shoes to walk near where this God is calling and speaking to me. The holiness of space, the holiness of life, all of this is holy purely by God's making. Leviticus, Exodus, it's filled. The Old Testament is filled with these proclamations of God's holiness. And God says, I am holy, right? The great I am, one of the great I am statements. I am holy, therefore you, because you're my people, shall be called holy. We are not called holy by what we do, but by the God that claims us as God's holy people No matter who we are, no matter where we are in our faith journey, God says, you are my people. This is the great kind of expansive theology of Paul, who says all of you are inheritors of Abraham's covenant and promise. All of you are. You are holy people because I am your holy God. The church, therefore, is holy, not because we make its grounds holy, though we do like to bless churches. I 
love knocking on the door and making the sign of the cross. I love to set things apart. And when a new church is made, you, you pray for the instruments and you pray for the, for the altar hangings and all the artisans that have been part of the cross and the table. And you pray for the table before you can do Eucharist. And we, we, we do this practice. But it is to open our eyes to the holiness in God's hand at work in the world about us. We are not actually making something holy. You, who are to be confirmed and reaffirmed today, are holy people already. Because God is your God. And that God is holy. It is, in some way, to come to terms with a very old word, the mysterium tremendum of who God is, the tremendous mystery of God's otherness and holiness. And this idea then, oneness of the church and holiness are based upon who God is first. And secondly, only secondly, our participation in that recognition of that God making us different. Now, some believe that Catholic, that we say all the time, and you will reaffirm today as all of us join in reaffirming our baptismal covenant, means Roman Catholic. But it doesn't. Uh, that's not, it's not a denominational statement. But this is, this is what we mean instead by Catholic. It means that it is universal, that we participate with a universal faith. And sometimes I think when we're in a small congregation or a congregation in anywhere, and Jackson, I was in Jacksonville a couple of weeks ago, the cathedral here, sometimes it's so easy for us to get focused on our, our local context and our local ministry where we are. But every Sunday we remind ourselves that we are part literally of a universal faith that is being proclaimed all around the world from the time the sun comes up to the time that it sets on, on Sunday, that we are about a proclamation joining with over 2.9 billion people. So today, when the people stand up and say that we will support you in your life in Christ, they make that promise, not just because St. George's makes that promise, which it does, but the Diocese of Texas and the Episcopal Church and the worldwide universal church of believers. It is our work to make this proclamation to support people in their life in Christ. Christians with all their faith make this statement in this one God and God's holiness, God's holy otherness in the person of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Uh, certainly this is a Trinitarian proclamation. And if you've got questions, Matt is ready to answer all of the more complex questions I don't answer in this sermon. But it is to say, aren't you already? Yeah, yeah, man, I'm throwing you, uh, I'm throwing you some easy softballs here. Uh, but it is to say that people of every tribe and type of every nation and every place join with us constantly in this universal faith, which is a recognition of a universal God, a God who is almighty, who is greater than all things, a God who is one God. There is only one God in our proclamation, and that God reaches out God's arms universally to all people. It is when we stand up and say this today to make a particular claim about God and who God is and how we are made through God's Holy Spirit, holy in this place, other than the world around us, how we are made one and how we are made a part of of God's universal love for the whole world. Make no mistake, this is a very high bar to respond to. <laughs> but that's the work. If we recognize this 
kind God, this amazing God who cares, who raised the people out of Israel and who raises Jesus, who raises us on our last day, who loves us and welcomes us regardless of any human criteria. Our work truly is to respond to that God. How will we live our lives if that's the God we proclaim, pray to, and worship? The challenge in Advent is the recognition that we worship the God of the first Advent. And that we long that the world would be made like the promises he has given us in Jesus. And so we live a life reflecting the oneness, the holiness, and the universal nature of hospitality, kindness, and love. And we wait, we wait and pray for the second advent and all the goodness that God brings when that happens. And so until then, I will promise you, we are going to fumble towards that goal. We will not get it right. We're not going to get it perfect. But God is present in that and with us. With all our questions, with all our hopes, with all our challenges, even when we're so angry with God, we raise our fist. We say, that's not just. God is present and accepts and hears that and waits and waits as we wait. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.